embedded in the dark crevices of the human soul. Okay, we're doing well. Uh, who is here because they're interested in Sherlock Holmes? Ah, hooray! Welcome to Sherlock Holmes and the birth of crime science. So uh, I've always been a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes. The first time that I read the entire canon, which includes four novels and 56 stories, I was 10 and I had nightmares for months. And uh, since then I've been reading the whole canon every year or two and I'm absolutely fascinated with it. Uh, ordinarily my work has to do with criminal justice, prisons, corrections. Uh, I've published books about California parole, about the impact of economics on prisons. Uh, and I'm now working on my fourth book, which is due in a week, uh, about COVID-19 in California prisons. And after I'm done with those projects, I'm possibly going to turn uh, to my old childhood love of Sherlock Holmes stories and uh, talk a little bit about the stuff that we're going to talk about uh, tonight. So, uh, doop, there we go. So many of you probably encountered Sherlock Holmes stories in books, you know, the novels coming in as books and the stories coming in as collections. But this is not the form in which they originally appeared. So the British public was exposed to uh, Conan Doyle's uh, uh, home stories through a magazine called The Strand Magazine, which had a very wide distribution and uh, did not include just Sherlock Holmes stuff, but all kinds of gothica and horror and all kinds of things like that was very much popular reading. It was not sort of high literature and it became extremely popular. The demand for the stories were so popular that uh, Doyle was actually bombarded with letters about Holmes and people asking him to tell things to Holmes and, and, and the like. And uh, after he published the first, what would later become the first volume of short stories, uh, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, which ends with a story called The Final Problem. Uh, those of you who are big Sherlock Holmes fans remember that this is the story in which Holmes and Moriarty fight to the death uh, off the Reichenbach Falls. Um, Doyle was actually quite pleased because he was getting sick of Holmes and what he actually wanted to write about was all kinds of historical military novels. And people didn't want that, they wanted more Holmes. And, uh, and he, he has letters that he wrote at the time where he's furious that he has to bring him back from the dead. And bring him back he did and wrote many more stories and a couple more uh, novels. And all, all things considered, this spans a whole quarter century of the Victorian era. So, so starting with the late 19th century, moving into the 20th century. So the stories actually span quite a lengthy period of time. Now, the real-life model for Sherlock Holmes was a Scottish pathologist by the name of Joseph Bell. This is somebody that Doyle studied with as a physician and very much admired because he had such amazing deductive skills. So, uh, so he was very impressed with the way that uh, deductions were made in the pathological lab to help and solve crimes. And Joseph Bell was so pleased that they made a, a fictional detective in his form that he ended up writing a few medical articles analyzing Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, and so a lot of times people think about Joseph Bell as being the real Sherlock Holmes. But Bell's methods were not unique to Bell. And there's actually a much broader background here that has to do with a very special moment in European history and the emergence of what we're gonna call crime science or the science of criminality. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the 19th century features this explosion of amazing new sciences and they all coalesce in a really special moment where many of them can be applied directly to the study and, and solving of crime. One of the things that becomes quite influential is the emergence of modern statistics. So a Belgian statistician, or what we would now call a statistician, Adolf Ketelet, comes up with this idea that you don't have to just measure individuals specifically, but you can collect information about a lot of different people and come up with a picture of what a whole city or a whole country is like in the aggregate. Now this seems pretty obvious to all of us, but at the time this was truly revolutionary. And it was especially revolutionary when it applied to things that people thought about as very individualized and very personal. One example is sociologist Emile Durkheim's work on suicide. So Durkheim, who is now considered one of the major granddaddies of modern sociology, writes his dissertation about suicide, which you would think is the most personal, intimate thing that you can think of, but he actually collects data about suicide, reasons, backgrounds, demographics of people through various countries and comes up with all these 
general conclusions about you know, social isolation and different national cultures and whether they produce high or low suicide rates and things like that. And this exposes people to the idea that even things that are deeply personal can be studied in the aggregate. At the same time, there's also new ways of studying things. So new sciences emerge, such, such as the science of physiognomy. Physiognomy has to do with learning things about you from the way that your physiology is, from the structure of your body, from the structure of your head. And alongside the birth of ideas in physiognomy, they also come up with new measuring implements that fit the science of physiognomy. So that is how they measure, for example, if somebody is, uh, they, they have names for it, ectomorph, mesomorph, like what kind of, what's your body type and what that tells us about you. In addition, another new science that emerges is the science of phrenology. Phrenology is a science that has everything to do with the structure of your skull. And the idea is that different parts of your skull represent different qualities of virtues or aspects of your character. And by learning the shape of your skull, we can learn something about your internal character. And as with physiognomy, phrenology also comes hand in hand with measuring apparatuses to uh, figure out the shape of your skull. Alongside these kind of junk sciences, a man by the name of Charles Darwin develops the theory of evolution. And uh, evolution, which initially provokes an enormous amount of resistance because it flies in the face of ideas that separate humans from non-humans, begins to appeal to a lot of people for the right reasons and to other people for the wrong reasons. And uh, many people at the time begin to apply or extrapolate ideas from evolutionary theory to all kinds of social scenarios, trying to think about people who are more advanced or less advanced and start applying it in a variety of ethnic, racial, national contexts to try to understand things. This is what we now know as social Darwinism. And, and this also begins to sort of kiss eugenics, and which is something that we'll, we'll, get, to, we'll get to soon enough. So all of these things are sort of floating alongside many other scientific discoveries and all of, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a coincidence that steampunk has caught as much as it has because it really captures this moment of immense excitement about scientific and, and technological inventions that happened in the 19th century. So one way in which all these sciences impact crime is practical applications. So, and why aren't my slides moving? Hold on, I think my slides are stuck. This is gonna be quite a shame. Uh, okay, because they're awesome. Okay, I'll just move them like this. All right, so one practical application is the, is the study of forensics. So we see innovations in terms of trying to identify criminals, so trying to figure out people's fingerprints, footprints. This is the time where Alphonse Bertillon, who's working with, uh, with the French police, comes up with the idea that fingerprints are unique to people and you can identify them. As some of you might know, recently there's been a hugely critical review of various forensic methods that emerged in that era and we're finding out that a lot of things we thought were marvelous are actually junk. Uh, we're finding a lot of this out about fabric analysis, about shoe analysis, about hair analysis. Uh, there are serious reasons to doubt fingerprints and fingerprint analysis. They've done all kinds of blind experiments where they give the same fingerprint to people, to different people, and they find completely different similarities. So, uh, so we're now finding all of this out, but at the time, this was considered immensely influential. But at the same time, there's something even deeper that's going on and that is going to take all of these scientific methods and apply them to the question of why certain people commit crime. In other words, what's wrong with them? So in order to explain what happens, I'm gonna take you on a tour to Italy, pre-unification Italy. So Italy, prior to its unification in the 19th century, is basically a constellation of all kinds of principalities where there's lots of different cultures and different ways of living. And then, in the 19th century, Italy becomes unified and becomes one country. But when Italy becomes unified, scientists from northern Italy start puzzling over the differences between northern Italians and southern Italians. And the questions that they ask is essentially, why are southern Italians and why is southern Italy so backwards?
And it's backwards in a lot of ways. It's backwards in terms of education, of, of infant mortality, of health, of all these things that Ketelet told us to measure statistically. So there's this explosion of Italian research collecting data about all of Italy and looking at comparing you know, the different former principalities one to the other, trying to figure out what's going on. Today, we have a fairly simple answer to the question why Southern Italy was so backwards. Uh, this is the work of three economists from 2017, which shows that the story is basically a story of economic disadvantage. The wages were basically, there were big gaps, and a lot of the disadvantages were basically a function of the fact that people didn't have much. So, uh, so sort of on the left, for example, you see comparisons between different countries, but what you see on the very right are comparisons between North and South Italy, North Italy on the top, and South Italy on the bottom. But of course, this kind of explanation didn't appeal to the Northern Italian scientists of the 19th century. And they suggested that what is really going on is that it's just different types of people. That there's this predetermination, there's immutable differences between Northern Italians and Southern Italians, and that's why Southern Italians are so backwards. And here's where our tour takes us to the very north of Italy, the University of Turin. So many of the images that I'm going to show you come from uh, my visit to Torino and my visit to, to the Lombroso Museum. So, so this, is, uh, this is basically the scene of the crime. This is, this is where it happened. Uh, and this door, behind this door, is the office of where Dr. Cesare Lombroso worked. Uh, he was a celebrated pathologist and was a very well-respected member of the faculty in Turin in the late 19th century. So he's doing a lot of uh, studies in pathology and he's deeply interested in all of these sciences and in questions of innateness and traits and what we can learn about them. Uh, here you can see a picture of his office. I am going to try and show the slides just because uh, otherwise they lose some of their impact. So bear with me uh, and hopefully they'll be able to move along. So this is Lombroso's study and what you see over there on his desk on the right is basically the skull that started it all. Uh, they preserved it and we'll talk about it in a minute. So the story is basically, nope, the slides will not move. Okay, all right. That's a bummer, but we will not let that upset us. Okay, so this is the skull that started it all and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how, how he did what he did. So he conducts original research in what at the time was considered to be a very systematic manner of studying things. He was extremely interested in what brings people to criminality and specifically in head shapes. So very much a proponent of phrenology and, and kind of looking at skulls and understanding their abnormalities and what they might suggest about criminality and all kinds of other negative traits. And then his real breakthrough comes through when he conducts the autopsy of a known road bandit. So he gets the corpse, he already knows, of course, that so there's no kind of double blind, he knows that this guy is, is, is a, a known uh, bandit. And then as he analyzes his skull, he concludes that there are certain abnormalities in the skull that suggest that this guy already had a predisposition for crime, sort of an innate predisposition of crime. I've attended uh, an autopsy that follows the footsteps of this and it's sort of kind of like a model autopsy and basically what they show is that in today's terms, what he did was completely farcical. Like he made some pretty serious mistakes and his conclusions of course we now know were 100% erroneous. But in the prevailing climate at the time, during all of this excitement about scientific discovery and evolution and enthusiasm and all of that stuff, people really embraced these insights because they were in line with this idea that you can sort of find out what is wrong with somebody and then, and then sort of proceed from that. So Lombroso proceeds to generalize from his findings. And again, this is a time when people start getting fascinated by research and by aggregate research. So he starts basically accumulating bodies and, 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 and analyzing them and studying them and, and, uh, and, and you know, conducting their autopsies on, on, on them. And, uh, and his general conclusions are then published in this book that becomes an absolute bestseller in the field. It's called L'Uomo Delinquente, uh, Criminal Man. The basic premise of criminal man is that criminals can be distinguished from law-abiding people, that there are important differences between criminals and between uh, people who are law-abiding. So, so in other words, I would say that what defines what criminality is is not whether you violated the law, but rather something about you that is deviant, that is pathological, that is different from other people. 
And then he says, you can identify these pathological characteristics and you can use them to predict that somebody's gonna be a criminal. So even though most of his work is actually kind of ex post facto, so he's looking at images and pictures and death masks of people that he already knows are criminals, he's saying, my generalization from this is so strong and so robust that I'm gonna be able to look at somebody's face and I'll be able to tell you if they're a criminal or not. And then, and then uh, not only is it possible to tell the criminals from the non-criminals, but it is also possible to tell what your criminal specialization is going to be. So the faces or skulls or heads of thieves or murderers or embezzlers or all kinds of people would be different from each other. And this book features pages upon pages upon pages of drawings and reproductions of heads. So you'll be seeing pages of thieves, pages of murderers, and he'll try to show you that there are characteristics that repeat themselves in all of these shapes. Now, what is it that makes these abnormally scalded people criminal? So here's where Lombroso relies essentially on Darwin. And he says the reason people have these physiological characteristics is because of their evolutionary stage. So he says these people are atavistic. Atavistic means people who are sort of th evolutionary throwbacks. They're stuck in sort of a primordial evolutionary, like if you will, the kind of like the, the branches of the tree of life that didn't quite make it. And he says, you know, occasionally, you know, overall we're all kind of evolving and growing, but occasionally there's like a branch that goes in the wrong direction and it's kind of a fluke, and that's when you get crime. So atavism and the idea of evolutionary backwardness or, or pathology is very much a part of what's going on in this book. So just to give you an idea of what this collection spans and how he drew these conclusions. So here, for example, is it says Ladro. This is a death mask of a thief that uh, is kept in the museum. There's another death mask. This is a whole, just, so there's just, you know, you just walk through and there's just cupboards upon cupboards filled with death masks of criminals. Um, and, and by the way, interesting question you might want to ask, how did he get all of these criminals and how did he obtain all of these death masks? Well, Criminal Man was such a popular book that people started sending him things. So he actually started receiving at the lab, like people's skeletons and skulls and death masks and would travel to places to obtain more things for his collection. So also entire skeletons that he analyzed according to physiognomy. So he would stack them one against the other to try and see if there are any differences in sort of the, the uh, relative measures of the hands or the legs. There's another uh, uh, cupboard full of uh, criminal skulls that he's uh, using for his analysis. And in addition to that, he also has drawings or portraits of them made. Now, some of these are made from death masks. Some of these are made from the periodicals in which stories appeared about these people. Because in addition to the Strand, there's also a lot of kind of real life, kind of true crime horror magazines that are circulating through, uh, through France. Those of you who love French Impressionism will remember that a lot of Magritte paintings, for example, are deeply influenced by a French magazine like that called Fantôme. So there's a lot of this kind of lurid material going about, and there's often stories about what's going on in the criminal courts. So that's where a lot of these uh, faces come from. Here's a few more of these portraits. And uh, here is another one. This is just kind of to give you an example of what a page in the book would look like. So either he would list where people are from because he's trying to distinguish also criminals from different countries whose heads are different because the whole question of culture and nationality is very much a part of the story here. Now, <laughs> that all of this pseudoscientific study would not pass muster today is pretty clear because Lombroso would study things as kind of physiological realities that are not innate, obviously. Like one of the things he was very deeply interested in was people's tattoos. So there's pages upon pages reproducing images of people's tattoos and trying to analyze them. And of course, uh, this is a representation of people's choices and the subcultures that they belong to and all of that. But he looks at it as part of their physiological deformity, like, you know, Oh, surely you must be abnormal to, to have this. Not that he thinks that it's innate, but he would think that this in some way becomes associated with what your body can tell us about you. Um, 
And then on top of all of these collections, he also collected clothing and weapons of famous criminals. Uh, there are some stories about how he procured some of these things. Uh, he starts having relationships with police departments, with people that investigate all this crime. So they basically send him things that today would be regarded basically forensic evidence in these cases. So if you see in the very far right picture, he has a mask, a face mask of a, of a, a, a highway robber. Uh, more artifacts belonging to criminals. There's other images here. And there's the skeletons. What else do we have? Yes, implements of punishment. So uh, corporal punishment is still to some extent practiced in Italy, although this is already a time at which we're transitioning into, incar into incarceration. But even if we're putting people in prison, there's still a considerable amount of, 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 uh, of basically physical torture that's going on, and he's collecting those artifacts as well. He's touring prisons. He's talking to the prisoners. He's talking to the wardens. Um, some artifacts taken from prisoners. And in fact, he collected and studied a lot of things that prisoners made in prison, again, of which there are rooms upon rooms in his, in his, uh, in his uh, office. For example, every prisoner in Italy had to make a water jug for himself to drink uh, at the prison, and they decorated them with various writings and drawings and all sorts of things like that. And Lombroso basically collected the jugs and tried to learn from the drawings something about the pathology of the people that were using the drawings. Uh, here are clothes that prisoners wove from collected hair. It was very, very cold in the prisons at night, so people had to make themselves clothes. They were not provided with warm clothes. Here is a wooden doll that they made in the shape of the warden in one of the prisons that, again, ended up in Lombroso's possession somehow. And even this incredible clay-made tableau of the person's trial. So this person recreated their own criminal trial out of clay. So collected this whole thing and had all kinds of deductions about it. Now, you might have noticed that when I said prisoners, I said men or him, or I referred to that. And that's because women were studied separately in the context of Lombroso's criminality. So following the success of Criminal Man, uh, in 1891, the sequel came out, uh, Criminal Woman. And uh, here's the theory that uh, Lombroso and his colleague Ferrero had about women criminality. So the idea is that criminal women are doubly deviant in the sense that they're already deviant. They're already in a sort of an inferior evolutionary place just by virtue of their sex. And then on top of that, they're also evolutionarily pathological compared to law-abiding women. Uh, he has pages where he compares, uh, you, if, if you can see that the, the, um, the subtitle is La prostituta y la donna normale, so the prostitute and the normal lady. So you can see that there's like, even compared to, you know, normal ladies that are already an abnormality or even more of an abnormality. And then the idea is that women are more infant-like, they're less sophisticated, they're, you know, underdeveloped evolutionarily because of their sex. And then on top of all of this distinction in sex, we also have, of course, in the books, a considerable amount of effort distinguishing various races from one another. This is not just people that he would consider exotic savages, which is anybody outside of Europe, but even comparing people from European nations to each other. And of course, you heard me say this at the beginning, every time somebody from Southern Italy comes up, you know, this also comes up. And this line of thought, as you can imagine, this idea that savages are not as developed or not fully embraced by the human race to the extent that uh, Europeans uh, were, was enthusiastically embraced, embraced by eugenicists both in, both in Italy and abroad, because this book became a huge, a huge uh, success. And these are folks that ended up exploiting evolutionary theory for their own ideological purposes. Uh, you may know, and if you don't know, then, then we all should know this, that the United States was no exception to this. Uh, Lombroso's book, Criminal Man, was incredibly popular here. And in fact, it was used as one of the major arguments for forced sterilization of people with mental retardation and other things. Uh, I know there's a couple of law people in the room who are familiar with Buck versus Bell, the decision about the forced sterilization of a woman who we now know was mistakenly identified as having mental, mental retardation. And uh, Justice Holmes, who was you know, celebrated in other contexts, had written in the decision in which he supports this, uh, three generations of imbeciles is enough. So basically supporting this Lombrosian uh, uh, line of thinking. And this later evolves into a concept in America, at least called feeble-mindedness, when we talk about uh, uh, criminality and its connections to, to people's disabilities.
So why is this related to Sherlock Holmes? So as I'm about to show you, the Sherlock Holmes story are a huge party of positivist criminology. Like ideas of positivist criminology really brim through the stories in many ways. And what I want to do is I want to illuminate a few contexts in which this comes up. So first of all, you don't even have to dig very deep because positivism is actually explicitly discussed and hailed in one of the most famous Sherlock Holmes stories, The Hound of the Baskervilles. So in The Hound of the Baskervilles, Holmes and Watson are sitting in their office when they receive a visit from a man called Dr. Mortimer. Oh, I'm sorry. They first, they find the walking stick of Dr. Mortimer. They don't know who he is, so Sherlock Holmes makes all kinds of deductions and figures out who he is and what his story is going to be. And then they look him up and they find out that he is basically a Lombrosian. So here are some of the writings of Dr. Mortimer. Let me see, uh, titles of his, uh, is disease a reversion? Uh, some freaks of atavism. Do we progress, question mark? So these are actual quotes from his studies. So this is basically the Lombroso of England who has come to talk to them about crime. And then when he talks to them, he actually starts coveting Sherlock Holmes's skull for his own study because he's a phrenologist. So he sits down and he talks to them like, this is, this is really polite, like imagine somebody's coming to see you and then they're like, you know, I would really like to study your skull. So, so Mortimer says to Holmes, you interest me very much, Mr. Holmes. I had hardly expected such a dociophallic a skull of such a well-marked superorbital development. Would you have any objection to my running your finger along your parietal fissure? A cast of your skull, sir, until the original is available, would be an ornament to any anthropological museum. So this is kind of like the can I touch your hair of, of phrenology, I guess. And then Sherlock Holmes is a little bit appalled and says, you're an enthusiast in your line of thought, I perceive, sir. I am in mine. So uh, Holmes is not pleased with the fact that this guy's coveting his skull. So, so this kind of gives you, this tells you that what I'm about to tell you is not coincidental. So it's not like Doyle, it was just a fluke and it was just in the air. He was very aware that the science was around. It was very much what informed the way that he shaped the stories. So here are some ways in which this comes up. First of all, the whole idea of hereditary traits and how character and pathology passes through a family is a really fixed feature in all the stories. So for example, we have a story called The Copper Beaches, which is a story of uh, a young woman called Violent Hunter, who is uh, quite a bra brave and plucky gal, who ends up getting an extremely lucrative offer to be a governess for a really atrocious and scary family. She's kind of like completely diabolical dad, kind of like a milquitoast, nondescript mom. And uh, she becomes the governess of a little child who is extremely cruel. And, you know, the dad's like, oh, you should see him kill cockroaches, kind of like with enthusiasm. And she's like totally appalled. And it later turned out, shall I do spoilers? Is that going to ruin the stories for you? Let's, let's do spoilers. So the weird thing is that they offer her a salary that's like four times what a governess was offered in those times. She's like, what's going on? And then they start making peculiar requests. Like they say, we need you to cut off all your hair. She says, no, my hair is so lustrous and beautiful. And they're like, nope, we must insist. There's no job if you don't cut your hair. Finally, she's like, listen, 120 pounds a year. You know, what's the hair? Hair grows. She chops off the hair. Uh, and then they demand that she wear a particular type of dress. And then they seat her in particular places in the parlor, and when she tries to trick them to figure out what the, what the story is with a little mirror, and she sees some young guy lurking in the backyard, they start telling her, you need to shoo him away. Holmes takes all of this together and deduces that what's really going on is that they're trying to get her to impersonate somebody, to basically chase this guy away. And it turns out that this somebody is the girl of this horrific man from a previous marriage whom he keeps uh, locked up in the attic. Yeah. Okay. So, so in any case, so, 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 what's, so Holmes, after he unpacks all of this stuff, he says, um, my dear Watson, you as a medical man are continually gaining light as to the tendencies of a child by the study of the parents. Don't you see that the converse is equally valid? I have frequently gained my first real insight into the character of par parents by studying their children. This child's disposition is abnormally cruel, merely for cruelty's sake. And whatever he derives this from, wherever, whether he derives this from his smiling father, as I should suspect, or from his mother, it bodes evil for the poor girl who is in their power. 
So looking at the pathology of the kid is indicative of the pathology of the dad. And then we have another pathological child in a story called the Sussex Vampire, which also includes all kinds of sexism and colonialism wrapped up as well, because the story in the Sussex Vampire is about this guy who travels with his business. In Peru, he meets this exotic beauty. Uh, what happens to her is what happens to all exotic beauties in Sherlock Holmes stories, which is they marry British men who, after a few years back in the metropole, get tired of the women, find out that they have nothing in common with her, and then she becomes unloved and proceeds to do horrible things. In this case, the woman is perfectly innocent. She's being accused of being a vampire because she is caught with her mouth bleeding and the baby, her baby in her hands. And, and, and they're worried that she was trying to suck blood basically off of the baby. It later transpires that what she was trying to do was save him from poison darts that his older brother was shooting at him that the dad brought from his travels. Now, Jackie, this is the, the, the evil child. This is the Chucky of the story, right? So, so Jackie, the evil child, is, is being perceived. And here's the description. Here's how Holmes explained how he figured out uh, what was up. I watched him as you fondled the child just now. His face was clearly reflected in the glass of the window where the shutter formed a background. I saw such jealousy, such cruel hatred as I have seldom seen in a human face. My Jackie, this is the dad, completely horrified, yes? You have to face it, Mr. Ferguson. It is the most painful because it is distorted love, a maniacal, exaggerated, exaggerated love for you and possibly for his dead mother, which has prompted his action. His very soul is consumed with hatred for this splendid child whose health and beauty are a contrast to his own weakness. So also a smidgen of, of, of hating on people with disabilities, and they're also already kind of suspect. We'll come back to people with disabilities and the role that they play in the stories in, in a little bit. So that's just the nuclear family, but things go far before that, and he also has comments about you know, back uh, ancestry. So in fact, uh, in one of the stories, The Empty House, the perpetrator is Colonel Sebastian Moran, who is a, a, a wonderful uh, sharpshooter, and uh, who ends up, they figure out that he's the one who killed a guy, who, uh, who a young guy who was in a closed house, through the window when there was no other access possible from a, from a window across the street. And then they look him up because they have an index on everybody and they found out that he had a very honorable career as a soldier. So here's uh, Watson completely amazed. This is astonishing. This man's career is that of an honorable soldier. And then look, look at how Holmes explains how this can be. It is true, Holmes answered. Up to a certain point he did well. He was always a man of iron nerve. And the story is still told in India of how he crawled down a drain after a wounded man-eating tiger. There are some trees, Watson, which grow to a certain height and then suddenly develop some unsightly eccentricity. You will see it often in humans. I have a theory that the individual represents in his development the whole procession of his ancestors and that such a turn to good or evil stands for some strong influence which came into the line of his pedigree. The person becomes, if it were, the epitome of the history of his own family. And then we have a classic example of this in uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles. So The Hound of the Baskervilles is a story in which they come to a place called the Grimpen Moor and, uh, and a new person inherits the estate. He's actually American, his name is Henry, Henry Baskerville. He inherits the estate after the tragic death of his father, uh, who, uh, of, of, of his relative who is said to have been mauled by a mythical giant hound. And Holmes doesn't believe in such superstitions because like Lombroso and the whole, the rest of the band, He's a man of science, right? So they're trying to figure this out, and they managed to finally figure out that the, the, the evildoer is a neighbor, uh, an entomologist by the name of Stapleton, who is trying to take over the estate by scaring people with legends about the hound and, and actually has a real dog that he covers in phosphorus so that he'll be, you know, he'll shine at night uh, and, and, and then, you know, frighten people to death. And the way they figure out who Stapleton is, is by looking at a painting that's hanging in the Baskerville estate. The painting is of the original ancestor, Hugo Baskerville, who was known to be an evil person and with whom the legend of the terrifying hound originates. So they're looking at the picture, so they're staring at Hugo Baskerville's picture, and then uh, Holmes says to, to, to Watson, is this like anyone you know? And he says, there is something of, of Sir Henry about the jaw. And he says, but a suggestion perhaps, but wait an instant. He stood upon a chair and holding the light in his left hand, he curved his right arm over the broad hat and round the long ringlets. 
Good heavens! I cried in amazement. The face of Stapleton had sprung out of the canvas. And then when they're kind of talking about, oh, I guess he is an ancestor of Hugo Baskerville and that's why he's doing all this, Sherlock Holmes also comments, it's an interesting instance of a throwback which appears to be both physical and spiritual. So this is not just about the machinations to try and get the estate, but also I'm evil because my ancestor is evil. Let's talk a little bit about women. So a few years ago, I took the entire Sherlock Holmes canon and I tried to map out the way that the women are described in the different stories. So here you have the basic characteristics of the women and you also have the years, the span of years in which women were described that way. So here's an interesting pattern. First of all, can you tell that there's a lot more women described as beautiful more than anything else? I can try, uh, let's see. Doo, doo, doo. Okay, so there's a lot more women who are beautiful than pretty much anything else. And you can also see that women described as beautiful spans the entire canon. So from the very beginning of the stories to the very last story. But then you can also see that there are kind of like little, little mentions. Like initially in the early stories, you can see women referred to as brave or smart, you know, kind of basically agents of their own destiny. And as this kind of Lombrosian framework takes over, you're seeing women described more as insane. So we're sort of shifting away from agency into pathology. Then we have, uh, and here I'm gonna have to pop back out and pop back in, so let's do that. Got one more table to show you. Uh, and that has to do with what role the women occupy in the story. So there's basically four ways in which women, bo both the criminals and the victims and anything in between figure in. So there's captives. So there's women who are either maltreated or abused or under some sort of diabolical power of men. And this is like 30 women out of the canon. Then we have women who are protectors. So people who are supportive of their man or act to protect a lover or a member of the family. So this is kind of like the classic stereotype of why women commit crime. Then we have muses. We have women who are not themselves the criminals, but the men say it was my love for her that drove me crazy and made me do this. And then you have a handful of women that I'm gonna call entrepreneurs. And those are the women who either commit a really kind of outrageous crime of passion or women who are more defiant, like Irene Adler, that many of you may remember from the very first story. Uh, Irene Adler is one of the only women that people remember from Sherlock Holmes stories, but she really is an outlier. And, and, that's, and that's why she's uh, so special because most of the other women were not as entrepreneurial as, uh, as her. So then in line with all of this uh, evolutionary stuff, we also have a lot of themes of the thin and blurred lines between the human and the non-human. So there's a lot of sort of alluding a lot to this uh, scientific idea of evolution and to the fact that there has to be kind of some order in nature and anybody who tries to subvert that is doing something terrible. So uh, one, way, one place in which these blurred lines between the human and the non-human happen is in the context of strange beliefs. So there are a few people, they're always foreign and they're always from non-global north places in the, in the books. I, I realize it's terribly antagonistic to even use the term global north in this context because that was really the only place that they thought you could find civilized people. So in Wisteria Lodge, for example, there's the story of a, an, a man who says he's from Spain, but he's actually from an imaginary country, probably in South America, or kind of a stand-in for a South American country, country called San Pedro. And he hosts this very stodgy English bachelor at his home. There's some kind of, you know, faint homoerotic stuff going on in that story, which we can talk about some other time. But, uh, but in any case, uh, when this guy wakes up, he's invited to stay overnight. And when he wakes up, he finds out that the entire staff of the house is gone. And the only things that are left are these really weird artifacts. Now here, listen to how they describe the artifacts. He held up his candle before an extraordinary object which stood at the back of the dresser. It was so wrinkled and shrunken and withered that it was difficult to say what it might have been. One could but say that it was black and leathery and that it bore some resemblance to a dwarfish human figure. At first, as I examined it, I thought that it was a mummified Negro baby. And then it seemed a very twisted and ancient monkey. 
So you can see here all the correlations, kind of the racist aspersions, the kind of like, what exactly is this thing? Is it human? Is it not human? And then he says, finally, I was left in doubt as to whether it was animal or human. A double band of white shells were strung around the center of it, which also gives you an indication that this is a religious artifact. It later transpires that this object belonged to the cook of this stodgy gentleman's host, and uh, and they end up and they end up catching him. And this brings us to the second theme, which is non-speaking parts for the non-Europeans. So you may recall that in Hollywood there were all these complaints that people who are playing what was known as ethnic parts, you know, playing people who are playing Indians in the cowboy and Indian movies and all of that stuff, didn't get speaking parts, or were basically communicating in grunts and in one words and, and whatever, and that serves to dehumanize these characters uh, uh, pretty seriously. I've recently read this incredible um, nonfiction book about uh, Duka Hanamoku, one of the most wonderful swimmers in, in the history of, of, of the world, who in the later part of his career, after his Olympic glory, came to Hollywood to play parts. And because he was very dark-skinned, he was Native American, he would play these parts, and there was often this conversation about how demeaning it was that he never got speaking parts. So, so we're seeing basically the same thing in the story. We're seeing that whenever there's a character like this that comes from a completely different place in a different context, they barely speak. And if they speak, they speak poorly. So here's the capture of the cook in Wisteria Lodge. This fellow is a perfect savage, as strong as a cart horse and as fierce as the devil. He chewed Downing's thumb nearly off before they could master him. He hardly speaks a word of English, and we can get nothing out of him but grunts. I should say it later turns out that this guy is completely innocent. Just kind of as, a, as an aside. Then we have a character from The Sign of the Four, which is one of the first Sherlock Holmes, uh, one of the, actually it's not one of the first, it's the third uh, Sherlock Holmes novel. So in The Sign of the Four, the story that, no, the si sorry, The Sign of the Four is the, sh the second novel, it's right after, uh, uh, yes, Sign of the Four is the second novel. So in The Sign of the Four, the, the major criminal is a guy named Jonathan Small, who lived in India for a very long time, did a pact with three other men, all of whom were Indians, about a treasure that they stole and they hid and wanted to take it, and then two English officers stole it from them. And this is Jonathan Small taking revenge over the people who wronged him. But along the way, in his travels, he picks up another man who helps him. And this man's name is Tonga, and he's from Papua New Guinea. So here is the description of uh, how Jonathan Small treats Tonga. I give you my word on the book that I never raised a hand against Mr. Sholto. It was that little hellhound Tonga who shot one of his cursed darts into him. I had no part in it, sir. I was as grieved as if it had been my blood. I welted the little devil with the slack end of the rope for it, but it was done and I could not undo it again. There's other verbiage that refers to Tonga as a child and that refers to him as barely human in the story. And he eventually meets with a horrible death that he 100% does not deserve uh, in, in, in this uh, story. And then we have all kinds of human, non-human bordering lines that are offenses against nature. So in The Creeping Man, the story is about an, old, an aging professor, his name is Professor Coram, who falls in love with a very young woman and wants to impress her with his virility. So uh, having no access to Viagra, that would only be invented more than 100 years later, he starts having a really mysterious correspondent with some uh, fishy European who sends him um, some animal potion to drink, and it affects the way that he behaves. He starts creeping, he starts grunting, he freaks out de decent young ladies in the window, uh, uh, and, and here's the letter that he gets from the guy who is supplying him with this stuff. Since your esteemed visit, I've thought much of your case, and though in your circumstances there are so special reasons for the treatment, I would nonetheless enjoin caution, as my results have shown that it is not without danger of a kind. It is possible that the serum of an anthropoid would have been better. I have, as I explained to you, used blackface languor because a specimen was accessible. Languor is, of course, a crawler and a climber, while anthropoid walks erect and is an always nearer. I beg you to take every possible precaution that there be no premature revelation of the process. I have one other client in England, and Dorak is my agent of both. And then Holmes says, the real, course, the real source lies, of course, in the untimely love affair, which gave our impetuous professor the idea that he could only gain his wish by turning himself into a younger man. When one tries to rise above nature, one is liable to fall below it. So this is what happens when we mix up the human with the non-human. Then we have the exotic, the deformed, and the bizarre. Uh, 
I've already given you some examples of the ways in which uh, people with disabilities are treated in the story. Uh, here's a story called The Crooked Man. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to uh, point out a few things that show you that the description of this man, who was horrifically, uh, uh, um, uh, basically was a sergeant in the army and then fell into captivity and was horrifically tortured by his captors and ended up completely physically broken and then again comes back to England and decides to, to take revenge. Uh, here, here is his description. Um, he appeared to be deformed for he carried his head low and walked with his knees bent. And then later on when they, oh, would have fallen down had the dreadful looking creature not caught hold of her. And then uh, her maid who sees them conversing, she's his former lover, she had no idea he was still alive. She sees them conversing and she says, I saw the crippled wretch standing by the lamppost and shaking his clenched fists in the air as if he were mad with rage. So these descriptions, again, crossing kind of the boundary between human and animal, essentially because of, of this man's disability. Then we have another kind of human and animal and exotic thing, which is all the people that have unique animal companions. So this guy that I just told you about from the, the story, The Crooked Man, his name is Henry Wood, uh, had a mongoose. And they found out the mongoose's uh, fingerprints on, uh, on a, part of the, a part of the house. And he starts talking about how uh, the crime happened, and then he says, and then I had to leave because Teddy was climbing the, uh, um, uh, the curtain. And then Holmes says, who is Teddy? And then the man shows, the man leaned over and pulled the front of a kind of hutch in the corner. In an instant out slipped a beautiful reddish brown creature, thin and lithe, with the legs of a stoat, a long thin nose, and a pair of the finest red eyes that ever I saw in an animal's head. It's a mongoose, I cried. So here's somebody who is already exotic and deformed and strange with an exotic, deformed, and strange companion. This happens also in the speckled band. The story of the speckled band is truly terrifying. Uh, the story is of these two uh, young women who end up living, uh, end up losing their mother and living with their abominable and terrifying stepfather in this old estate. And the stepfather had been many years in India. You can see that the theme, again, is every time you go abroad, you come back and there's something wrong with you. Kind of like you absorb the kind of the, the malaise of the, of the non-white world, right? So this guy comes back after also spending a stint in prison for killing his manservant. And then it turns out, uh, says uh, his daughter, he has a passion also for Indian animals, which are sent over to him by a correspondent. And he has at this moment a cheetah and a baboon, which wander freely over his grounds and are feared by the villagers almost as much as their master. It later turns out that the implement through which he tries to kill both of his stepdaughters is a snake. And this is the speckled band that's referenced in the title. Finally, we have people with unique hobbies and collections. So we've kind of seen the people that Lombrosian science thinks very little of as having all of these kind of, you know, iffy animals and mysterious, you know, customs from fishy parts of the world. And now we have the more refined criminals, the sophisticated criminals who collect fine things. So for example, in The Dying Detective, we're dealing with somebody called Culverton Smith. And his story is that he became an aficionado of um, communicative diseases. That's his spiel, even though he's not a doctor at all, he's interested in that. And then he puts poisoned stuff into beautiful artifacts and mails it to people to murder them. So uh, here's Holmes saying he's not a medical man, but a planter. He's a well-known resident of Sumatra, now visiting London. An outbreak of, the d of dis disease upon his plantation, which was distant from medical aid, caused him to study it himself with some rather far-reaching consequences. In another story, the illustrious client, and we'll, we'll end the kind of Sherlock Holmes uh, survey with that, uh, Holmes is tackling a famous Austrian murderer called Baron Edelbert Gruner. There's a lot of descriptions of people's physicality in the stories, and he's described as a very attractive man. And, and what Holmes is trying to do in this story is break up his engagement with this very young lady by trying to tell her that this guy kills all of his wives. And, and she won't believe him because she's in love, and then he's looking for whatever to do. In any case, they set up a trap for this guy, for Baron Gruner, and the trap involves trying to search his house for his little black book in which he writes demeaning things about the women in his life. And they're thinking, well, if she doesn't care about the murders, she will, she will care about this, this guy being a womanizer. So somebody's got to kind of do a decoy so that they can do that. And, and that's Watson. Uh, uh, Holmes sends him to study very fine Chinese pottery, because that's, that is this guy's craze. And he says, he has the collection mania in its most acute form, and especially on this subject on which he's an acknowledged authority.
This repeats itself with a lot of kind of like the more refined upper echelon of villains in the in the Holmes canon. It's like, you know, they're not going to have deformities. They're going to be physically impressive. They're not going to have weird animals, but they will have peculiar hobbies. Like there will be something about them that will suggest abnormality. Okay. So, all of these stories show up in the in the strand and this really popularizes positivism. And what this means is that the idea that criminality is innate and pathological and possibly incurable makes it really heavily into the public imagination. And it really stays there until well in the 1950s when criminologists start thinking, well maybe it's not about who you are, it's more about which neighborhood you grow up in and and other theories start coming up. This also means that the there's a lot of merging of medicalization and punishment. And you can still see a lot of remnants of this. I'm looking at people in the audience who study things like this. One of the aspects in which we see the merging of medicalization and punishment is in po even in popular culture, when you think about the Arkham Institute of the Criminally Insane, where does this come from? Who are these people? They're all Ambrosian, you know, all Ambrosian villains. They're all amalgams of the human and the non-human. They're all you know, all kinds of evolutionary throwbacks or all kinds of things gone wrong with, with the tree of life. This also means that the public begins to have overconfidence in profiling. Uh, I don't know how many of you watch Mindhunter or are interested in sort of the FBI profiling, but there's, there's an enormous amount of hubris in the FBI about this idea that you can tell about a serial killer from whether it's an organized or a disorganized uh, crime scene. There is literature that uh, really puts this into controversy and argues that this is all a bunch of crock and you actually can tell very little about what's going on from the scene, but there is so much popular culture that's generated around this idea that you can look at the scene of the crime and you can tell some like convincing story about the personality of the person who did it. We're also seeing, of course, criminality being tied to others, to people that are not like what they perceive to be the norm and exotified. We're seeing female criminality completely marginalized, the women kind of being put in the corner, you know, a handful of wise and brave women next to a lot of women described merely by their, uh, by their physicality. And, which I think might be the saddest outcome of all this, is just the immense popularization of eugenic and discriminatory perspectives that make it into the public domain. How much of this is left? How much of, the, of this is actually good science? So, of course, all the science I've described to you is, is complete hogwash, like none of this is true. Uh, just kind of in case there's any doubt. Here are some biological criminology theories that people are still pursuing. There are some people who have tried to tie people with three chromosomes, XXY or XYY chromosomes, to more violence or more aggression. There are some mixed pieces of evidence to this, so some people have found some connection and others have not. There are some theories, this is kind of like the, grand, the, the, the grandson of the, of the feeble-mindedness theory that try to tie IQ theories to what's going on with criminality. Also a fairly complicated issue because of the impact of environment on uh, the measuring of IQ. Then we have all kinds of issues of biochemical conditions. So now there's a lot of focus on pure, poor diet or homo hormone imbalance as maybe impacting criminology, uh, criminality. There is an emerging and actually quite successful trend called neuro law in, in law that says that you can actually tie certain neurophysiological conditions to the possible commission on crime. People have tried to argue about this as defenses. People have tried to use as affirmative defenses various abnormalities that they have and tried to argue about those. There is the issue of psychopathy which nobody really knows what to make of. You can tell whether somebody's a psychopath or not from neuroimaging of their mind. And we know that there are a lot of people in the crime world who are psychopathic. We also know that they're extremely successful CEOs and lawyers and businessmen and other people that feature uh, these characteristics. So the extent to which kind of like your inability to feel uh, empathy is tied to criminality really depends on the circumstances of your life and where you end up channeling this kind of unempathetic personality of yours. The most convincing theory of the lot is lead theory. They do find pretty strong connection between lead poisoning in childhood and criminality later in life. But of course, your exposure to lead theory is also your exposure to poverty, because who ends up living in houses that have lead? So it's really hard to divorce the environmental impact of your, of your uh, upbringing from whatever biological issues might come from the lead, and this is one of the weaknesses of the lead theory. That's it, my friends. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, we have time for about two or three questions, so I'll come around with my magical mic and hold it for you. Oh. So you described the lead theory, and I was going to ask, uh, when Lambrosa um, 
first noted a consistency with supposed criminal skulls, maybe he was noticing a consistency with childhood malnutrition. This is, this is quite possible. There are many aspects of the Lombrosian theory that can tie into all kinds of environmental issues. I mean, for one thing, a lot of the supposed abnormalities that he identified were just people of different ethnicities and different races and different geographical locations. We just, you know, one of the th wonderful things in the world is that we don't all look the same and that many of us look like our ancestors and like the place that we come from and these were ascribed to be abnormalities. So there are some ways to explain some of his findings with what we know now about environmental differences and the rest of them is just schlock. So some, some, of, it has, some of it has explanations and some of it is just hogwash. I think there's another one over here. Hi, um, I was wondering how much, if at all, Lombrosian science made it into the criminal justice program specifically with like figuring out if people are or are not guilty of certain crimes. So we do know that there are some places in which biology can, can provide an affirmative defense for people. So uh, for example, we recognize mental illness and we recognize some degree of mental retardation, but in order for you to be completely exonerated, it really has to pass legal tests rather than medical tests. So somewhere along the line, the medical knowledge that we have about you know, medical wellness or, or mental illness gets translated into these very rigid legal tests, which are now known as the McNaughton tests, which is that in order to be completely acquitted, you would have to completely not know what you're doing. Other countries throw in an extra condition, which is, uh, or an extra uh, uh, option for, for being acquitted, which is that you couldn't really choose, that you had this urge that you could not control to behave in a particular way. One of the things that we find out is that for people who are sort of in the Netherlands of between that and full choice, the legal system doesn't really offer a good solution and a lot of judges try to sort of cover for that by basically uh, giving you a lower sentence because they think that that's kind of what is gonna serve. It turns out that oftentimes people, and, and this depends, this changes by geography, people who are hospitalized or really rec truly recognized as criminally insane and therefore not responsible for their actions end up in places that are not necessarily better than, than the prisons that they would have been incarcerated in had they been found guilty. And, and really all, all this overlap between medicalization and, and punishment uh, finds its way to a lot of corners in the criminal justice system. Just to give you one example of a particular dark corner of this that I've encountered recently, uh, when I looked at COVID-19 and the way that St. Quentin right here, you know, half an hour from where we are dealt with this, is uh, when they had to find spaces to isolate the folks that were sick, they put them in uh, solitary confinement. So people identified basically medical isolation with something that for decades they've identified as punishment and no wonder they were hesitant to disclose symptoms or to get tested because they didn't want to get punished. So this is what happens when you make this undue mix of treating people, doing something that's health giving to another human being and, uh, and punishment. We could talk for hours about just that, but not today. <laughs> Other questions? There's a question over here. Um, in his studies, did he ever compare like criminals with normal people and like did he actually flag differences between those who are normal and those who are criminals? Yes, but we don't really know how systematically he picked the normal people and the criminals. So at the time it was considered a very scientifically impressive study because there's hundreds upon hundreds of faces. But of course this is not randomized, it's based on the things that he had access to. So if you're wondering like would a medical journal today publish you know, this kind of selection, the answer is of course not. All right, my friends, thank you very much for listening and have a good evening. Awesome, thank you everyone. And yes, another round of applause.